Hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to all of you joining us from near and far, um, from around the world, from New York City and uh, other places. I'm so happy to welcome you to the Aperture Book Photo Book Club uh, to celebrate Wendy Breadstar and her first monograph, Delegation, which is a co-publication of Aperture and Documentary Arts. My name is Brendan Emser, and I'm the managing editor of Aperture Magazine and the editor of Delegation. We would like to thank Ingram for their support of this series and, and also um, a deep thanks to Alan Govnar and Documentary Arts for his very generous support of Delegation. You may notice that things look a little bit different tonight. Out of an abundance of caution uh, due to a recent COVID exposure, we are coming to you um, remotely. And I really extend my thanks to the panelists tonight for rallying and um, their desire to continue with this program, which we're excited to bring to you. In addition, um, I will be sitting in as host this evening as Aperture's executive director, Sarah Meister, is currently, currently traveling for work. We will be taking questions at the end of this program tonight, so please feel free to add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time, and also stay tuned for our summer reading recommendations at the end of tonight's book club. Delegation is the first comprehensive monograph by Epsolake artist Wendy Redstar, whose photography, installations, prints and textile works recast historical narratives with wit, candor, and a feminist indigenous perspective. Uh, we first worked with Wendy in the capacity of her editing um, as guest editor of the fall 2020 issue, Native America, and this project grew in a beautiful way out of that um, exciting and meaningful moment, um, both for Aperture and for the magazine. Delegation includes contributions in the form of essays, interviews, stories, and poems by Jordan Amirakani, Annika K. Johnson, Julia Bryan Wilson, Whaley Long Soldier, Tiffany Midge, and Josh T. Franco. In addition to the star herself, we are so privileged to be joined tonight by Jordan and Josh, um, as well as Emily Anderson, the book's brilliant um, designer. So just to start off, would you all please take a moment to introduce yourself um, so we can all meet you and see you, uh, starting with Wendy, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you became involved with this project, uh, with Wendy's work in general, and Wendy, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about your experience with, with Aperture. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, such an honor to be here, especially with uh, um, everybody that's uh, contributed to the book. I'm so thrilled and honored. Um, and my relationship with um, Aperture started in 2020 at the very beginning of the pandemic. So I feel like we've kind of gone full circle here. <laughs> um, and that was to guest edit uh, the magazine uh, Native America. And uh, through that, then um, Brendan and uh, Michael offered me an opportunity to produce this beautiful monograph that we'll, we'll be talking about today. Thanks. Uh, Jordan, how about you? Sure. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jordan Amarcani. Um, I wrote an essay for this incredible publication, um, but I'm a curator and an art historian. Um, now working at Rivers Institute for Contemporary Art and Thought, which is based in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and gosh, I first started thinking about Wendy's work in like 2017 and have written about her work in two other iterations prior to this book, uh, once for a, an exhibition in Tennessee uh, and uh, in another iteration for an exhibition catalog uh, for her gallery at Sargent's Daughters. Um, and when Wendy asked me to be a part of this book, I could not even, I mean, I'm so proud to be a part of it. And um, it has been incredible to actually hold it in the hands. And um, as someone who thinks quite a lot about histories of feminist work in the 20th and 21st centuries, um, I think Wendy is sort of adding and expanding such an incredible legacy to that history. And um, I feel really excited to be able to, to find words to think through that. So, thanks, Jordan. That was lovely. And I would just add one 
detail, which is Jordan and I discovered that we have a mutual friend that um, we've both known for years and years in the process of this book. And I love, um, I love that connection. I think there's a lot of deep friendship and support and um, creative collaboration with Wendy and her crew over the years. And that's certainly reflected in this, in this book. Um, Josh, over to you. Josh is going to help us um, balance this program between uh, Oprah's book club and um, Ricky Lake. So as a professional interviewer himself. <laughs> I don't know which one I do or don't want to be in that, but okay. Um, I, uh, I'm, yeah, very honored, happy to be here. Um, I, you know, I've known Wendy's work for years just as a person in the world. Um, in 2020, we invited the, so first I'm the National Collector at the Archives of American Art, which is a unit of the Smithsonian. Um, so I lead the curatorial team in the collection of primary source materials, documents that tell the story of American art um, that we make available to researchers for use, um, which directly ties to this book. But to give a little more background, uh, we asked Wendy in 2020, um, to participate in our pandemic oral history program, which was 20 minute interviews with 85 artists across the US to create a record of the impact of the pandemic um, in that really, you know, summer when everything felt really wild um, to create a record of that. And Wendy participated there, which is great. Wendy also serves on the Archives of American Art Journal board, um, which we're so grateful for. And, um, then I would, yeah, and then Brendan, I got your email, I think late in 2020 or early 21 um, to interview Wendy for this book. We kind of counter offered with why don't we just do Wendy's full oral history? The archives has a collection of over 2,500 oral histories with artists, which are comprehensive life stories taken over multiple sessions, over multiple days. Um, so that's what we did, which was great to kind of use this as a platform to do that. And then uh, you brilliantly excerpted and edited that for the monograph. If anyone wants to see the full transcript, it's um, on our website at the archives. And finally, because Wendy's just all over Smithsonian, um, if you know Wendy's work, you know, Wendy, you're a fellow archives nerd, which is why we like working together so much. Uh, Wendy was a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow. Um, and had some really amazing experiences that are documented in the book with uh, collections at the National Museum of American Indian. And something I hope we can dig into is Wendy's work along with a couple of others um, has really given me this idea of how do we change our conception of research subjects as who we study in archives to ancestors and what does it mean to, to change the framework of how we think about the material, material we look at as belonging to ancestors and uh, we'll get into that, but thanks. Great, thank you. It was such a pleasure to work with you and we'll talk a little bit about how that interview um, that you did, which was epic, um, found its way um, into the book in a really wonderful manner. Um, and finally, I would introduce um, Emily Anderson, a designer who's based in Brooklyn. And I have to say there's something somewhat poignant about us all being on Zoom because I actually first encountered Emily on um, Aperture's first ever Zoom book launch in May. 2020, um, Emily designed Justine Curlin's beautiful Girl Pictures book, um, which is now in its third printing. So congrats to Emily and to Justine. Um, and I loved um, a kind of word of wisdom that Emily uh, gave in that program, which I think, and you can you can you can say it more eloquently, Emily, but Maybe. about how how a book is always of its time and also of the future. Did I get that? Right. What is it? So I, th I think it just, um, well, first off, hi, I'm Emily uh, uh, C.M. Anderson and have had the complete honor and privilege to uh, work with this amazing team and design um, Wendy's first monograph. Uh, it's just been an incredible experience and um, yep, graphic designer based in, in, in Brooklyn. Um, I think, it, uh, I think it was something along the lines of books being these kind of objects and they serve as this like crystallization or this moment in time that the project just becomes um, this whole record uh, and the information kind of settles and stays stays with us um, in that form um, from that point forward. So uh, I think it's something along those lines. Yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> 
Well, one of the reasons we were excited to work with you is because you, I think you've also done work with furniture and textiles and the Emily and Wendy's um, incredible work across different types of mediums and her attention to detail in terms of not just photography, but um, textiles and printmaking and um, objects and installations. I, we felt that you would be able to somehow navigate all these materials, which you did amazingly. And we'll talk a little bit about how you did that. Um, so thanks to you all for joining us. Um, and I think we'll start now, um, Clark, by just showing a few slides, um, which are photographs from um, of Wendy's beautiful book. So if we could just open up that first image, please, of the cover. So I would like to start with the, um, the cover image. Uh, this is a question for Emily and for Wendy. Um, it was really amazing when you kind of, Emily, in the process of designing this book, kind of gave us a menu of maybe four or five different directions of where we would go with the book. And this cover um, style and um, moment and projection of Wendy's work with, um, was kind of, it rose to the top pretty fast. And I think part of that was because of the spectacular image on the cover, which is a lithograph um, that Wendy made, I believe, at Crow Shadow. So, Wendy, do you want to tell us, first of all, about the story of this image and how that portrait actually finds its way throughout your body of work as a researcher and as an artist? Sure, yeah. Um, first off, I just got a flashback of some of the other covers and it was it was hard to choose as well. Um, there are so many amazing covers, but this one definitely did um, reach the top. Um, and as Josh mentioned, I was a Smithsonian Research um, Artist Fellow uh, between uh, 2018 and 2019. And um, I, um, had been gathering names um, from my family. Um, I'm really deeply into genealogy. And so I knew some of the, the names within my genealogy and I was looking through the National Museum of the American Indians photo archive. Um, and I had been flipping through this photographer, his name's Fred Miller. And um, he photographed uh, and lived, resided um, on the Crow Reservation and the 1900s, early 1900s. And so when I was flipping through his images, I um, saw this image of this powerful woman. Um, and luckily, uh, there was a description. Um, and it said, um, Julia bad boy, her dreams are true. And I immediately recognized that name from my family tree. Um, I had never seen an image of her. And so she is my great great grandma. And she has inspired a couple artworks. Um, so I decided to create this, this work, um, this lithograph at Crow Shadow. Um, and I'm blanking on the date, but it was pretty recent, <laughs> all within like the pandemic time. Can you, um, for those who don't know, uh, Wendy, could you just tell uh, folks what Crow Shadow is? Yes. Yeah, so Crow Shadow is this amazing um, printmaking facility. It's located. Um, in Eastern Oregon on the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And it was started by James Labrador, who is um, from um, the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And he just had this idea where he fell in love with printmaking and um, wanted to bring that to the community um, and bring, also bring artists to his community. Uh, so he, he hired a um, master printmaker um, and started a residency where he brought in different artists and artists would connect with the community and make prints. And um, out of that, um, um, I was, I've been there three times. It's, it's a really wonderful um, uh, place. And Emily, could you tell us a little bit about your thinking uh, about the cover and what attracted you to this and how you felt about this you know, being the kind of final um, decision. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, kind of echoing what um, both you and Wendy felt, but uh, we explored so many options. Um, I explored even more <laughs> than what I was uh, shared with the group. 
Um, but it, it was a rather immediate feeling. I think like Julia Bad Boy is the cover. It just, it found its place like very quickly. Um, and I think the overall book in and of itself, like trying to uh, decide the scale and, and uh, the book as an object, you know, I think we, we discussed a lot on how the book should feel in your hand and, and landing on words like heavy and intimate and exploratory. So I think, you know, some of the, you know, you'll kind of notice the book is slightly, slightly smaller um, give you a more intimate feeling. It's got a lot of heft, I think. Um, and all of that is kind of like transmitted both through the cover, but when you first kind of like pick it up, it, it feels like there's, it's heavy. There's so much there. Um, there's so much to explore inside. Um, and then I think uh, the red, um, it's a really powerful red um, and is very much like uh, inspired um, by how Wendy uses color. It is, uh, you know, taking this like uh, this very tactile red cloth. Um, again, cloth. Uh, it's, the book is covered in in a real, real, real cloth. So there's that tactility to it that kind of also lends itself to, to Wendy's work. Um, and that deep, bright red paired with this kind of strange, analogous candy pink that also just transmits this this energy. I think that that it that evokes the the her work as a whole so to me it was like a series of all of these decisions that really started to embody embody the work and and the experience ahead once you open it absolutely and clark if we could go to the next slide please um there are many special details um, of this book what we would call an aperture bells and whistles <laughs> and one um, that I seem to remember, Emily, that you were excited about and pushing for from the get-go were ribbons. And not only um, were these ribbons a kind of reference to a, a specific work, I think, in Wendy's um, body of work, but also you were exceptionally precise with the, with the colors. Are you happy with how yeah. the ribbons turned out? <laughs> oh my gosh, the ribbons are so amazing. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, it was just such a, again, like when you start to think of uh, books as objects, um, you know, you can really start to push um, all of the materials at your, at your disposal to really like embody um, and make these connections, these like tactile connections for the viewer to the work. So um, I am absolutely thrilled with how the, um, the ribbons really uh, bring out all of the colors from the Julia Bad Boy piece um, on, on the very front, uh, they divide a lot of the bells and whistles, if you will, and page experiences on the inside. Um, and then they also very directly connect with a series of work called the um, Fancy Shawl Project, which uh, feature a, a lot of different colors and, and, and these ribbons. So that kind of movement becomes part of the object um, of the book. Definitely. And could we go to the next slide, please? So we're gonna show you just a few more spreads from the book so you can see the visual experience. Um, Wendy, this is a series called Grandmothers, which um, Emily had the brilliant idea to set on a silver, um, uh, what do you call that actually? Uh, a silver, silver ground. Yeah, yeah, silver flood. Flood, yeah. And mm. Wendy, could you tell us about this project and actually why the, the silver matters in the, in the design and its kind of translation to a book form? Yeah, so this particular body of work was utilizing a photographer. His name was Richard Russell, and he was also um, residing on the Crow Reservation in the early 1900s. Um, and there are two things about Richard Russell um, that I've really um, engaged with. The first one is that um, out of photographers at the time period and photographers photographing Crow, he had so many photographs of women. So I really appreciated seeing uh, those images. Um, and then the other thing was that he was half Cree and half Scottish and was eventually adopted into the Crow tribe. So um, all of those things um, made me super interested in him. Um, and I created a, um, a body of work where I took these portraits of, um, I think it was, I don't know, maybe 30 Crow women. 
and um, isolated them and then um, turned them into like a, like a vinyl and adhered them to mirrors and square mirrors. Um, and they were installed um, in a gallery space where you could sort of walk through like a hallway and have encounter, you have to encounter yourself and also encounter them. Um, so we were struggling on how do we photograph these things? Um, they're so tricky. And uh, Emily came up with this wonderful idea. But I also wanted to share um, that Richard Dressel, um, when I discovered what Julia looked like through um, Fred Miller's images, I I was like, well, I know uh, Richard Thrussell's images. I wonder if um, she's been there that whole time and I've seen her and not known. And um, sure enough, so she's in the book here as well. So this is uh, Julia's picture taken by Richard Thrussell. Amazing. And as we said the other night, she she loved the camera. She, she knew, loved the camera. She knew how to pose. <laughs> and, you know, one thing I want to add about this series is that um, in the process of writing the captions for the book and working with your fantastic studio manager, um, Epiphany, you made some interventions in the, in the original captions. And um, there were many um, incidences where you chose to name someone, for example, mother of the Apostolic Nation. What was that kind of archival revision about? For me, that's one of the things that I, I have kind of a, it's really important for me to, to name all of these uh, individuals, um, and if I can find the name, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, make sure that it's written in the record. Um, but for some of these women, uh, and some of the research that I did, I wasn't able to find their names. So I wanted to honor them as part of our community. And so some of the titles for the women whose names I couldn't find, we titled "Ancestors of the Absalagate Nation." Ancestor, yeah, thanks yes. for that um, correction. Beautiful. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this image uh, that we're about to see um, is called Absalaki Roses. And do you just want to quickly tell us, Wendy, the story of this image, which I love and which we also published in Aperture Magazine, the Native America issue that you guest edited? Um, so I, I produced this at Crow Shadow as well. It's a lithograph. And this is, um, I really wanted to talk about um, the matrilineal kin, uh, kinship and clanship that my community has. And since my mother is white, I use my um, grandma, my dad's mom, um, and her clan, which is Pagan. We're known as the treacherous clan, which I always appreciate. And um, and so um, I wanted to sh showcase that. So I, this is a photo of B, I think around the age of eight, and then also a photograph of me on the, the right at the same age. And we're both um, attending the same event, which was called Crow Fair. And um, I was um, dressed by my mom and my grandma in our traditional altitude dress. And I believe my mom photographed me and then I did the same for B, and her grandma beaded her um, beadwork. But part of the background is um, my mom actually beaded the rose belt that Beatrice is wearing. Um, and she learned how to bead through this belt um, in collaboration with my grandma. So my grandma uh, was known for her rose design. So she drew all the rose roses, and then my mom beaded it. Um, so the background is um, her rose drawings and some of the um, beadwork that we, we captured as well. And Beatrice, for those who don't know, is your daughter and uh, former collaborator. And we'll talk about that collaboration um, in a little bit. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So um, there's just two more here that I wanted everyone to kind of see the, um, the beautiful design and the energy that um, Emily brought to representing um, many different series um, of Wendy's work over the course of 15 years. This one is Crow Masquerade Dance. And then finally, the last slide here, please. Um, this is an example of um, a text page and texts find their ways into 
the book in beautiful manner. And, um, and for those of you who have it, or hopefully will have it in your hands one of these days, the texts are set on an uncoded sheet. So there's a very different experience when you are paging through the book, when you were reading um, the essays, the paper is uncoded, it, it, it's a little bit toothy, and it's um, very different from the kind of glossier, um, heavier stock of the paper on which the plates are set. And um, I would just, this is a page from the uh, essay by Julia Bryan Wilson, who writes about your work with the Smithsonian Archives, and we'll talk about that with Josh in a moment, but um, I would just add it for those who are interested in the technical part of bookmaking, um, this book has 12 Pantones, which are special color processes. And Emily, do you want to just quickly gloss that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Us? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, you, you calculated or tallied up the Pantones. Um, it's a, a total of 12 Pantones. There's two different paper stocks. Um, there's multiple books within books um, or insets and booklets. There's gatefolds. Um, there's ribbons, there's a bespoke, like a colored thread that actually binds the book. So there's so many um, details and materials that were kind of brought into this, into this book. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think a note just on, on the typography as well um, and the text pages. I think this is also a, a space where we really used a lot of color, um, very much inspired by Wendy's work of uh, kind of combining these uh, analogous, but with a twist kind of uh, color color pairings, um, and also using kind of larger larger type, um, having the images become uh, monotone and bright bright color. Uh, so it's really actually difficult to find uh, text in black in this book. Um, you'll read it. Um, all of the essays are set in a in a in a rainbow of different um, inks and colors. I love that detail. So I think that's it for the slides. Um, thank you so much. So um, just before we move to our other um, speakers tonight, I wanted to just to mention again, Julia, who finds her way through this book and is the kind of guide one might say. And the book opens with a multiple um, page inter visual prelude, um, which I have now described as a kind of um, journey through to or through Crow territory. And Emily, do you want to just just turn the pages and, and show us the mm -hmm. first image here? Because the um, this was a decision that we made sort of at the end that um, Wendy's image from Ania um, would open the book um, as, a, as a relationship to the cover image of Julia. Yeah, so we can go through just quickly. Yeah. And, um, I think, I think to also note um, on the back, um, really uh, pieces from that series bookend um, the book. So uh, here is um, the piece uh, featuring Beatrice. And I yes. think that just um, this like gesture of, of beginning and ending the book um, with these works um, and with uh, Julia Badboy on the cover just kind of uh, echo that generational connection. That, yes, uh, in the so, matrilineal, so, yeah, the power, I think, of the of uh, the figure of the mother, the grandmother, the daughter, and, and the self. So one thing I will just, I just love so much about this book, among other elements, are the genius juxtapositions that Emily found. I think we did, we just kind of, you just ran with it. And I think, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to speak to Wendy, but I was like astounded when we were going through this and to just to see that you had spent so much time with these images and finding these pairings that would bring us through the beginning of the book with such a visual experience. And that was one of the elements of the brief when we started working with Emily, but the, the, whenever you open the book, there should be a, an incredible visual experience that you can just plunge into and um, and finding, yeah, these elements of the stars and different works that somehow rhymed together. I mean, it was, yeah. it was incredible. And then, yes, this is the part where we kind of, we're almost there um, at yeah. Crow Agency. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, it was really meant this, these early pages were really meant to just transport and immerse um, the viewer into Wendy's work. Um, yeah. Kind of, I think uh, some of the the 
combinations or these diptychs. Um, I wanted them to be a bit visually overt to kind of uh, set a precedent to look at the work deeper, um, just really get curious um, as you're looking through and viewing uh, not only in these immersive, immersively designed pages, but also in the more traditional kind of gallery pages, like mm -hmm. really um, sparking that connection for the reader to then kind of go deeper. Um, Absolutely. Do. Yeah. It's a little bit like the orchestra warming up at the beginning of a show and then finally we get to <laughs> delegation and the, and the book begins properly. So um, thanks for that introduction. Um, I wanted to go to <clears throat> Josh um, a little bit and ask what you think the word delegation means and how that connects to a lot of the work that Wendy has made over the years and what you think about it as the title uh, for this book. Oh, what a good question. <laughs> you know, that's such a good question. <laughs> uh, I mean, I thought immediately just because there's a lot of work to do at Smithsonian, this kind of like thinking about a whole country at once is a lot. And um, how nice it is when you can delegate work out. <laughs> so I thought yes. of that for sure. <laughs> Um, which is just from my very particular position. Um, but I, but you know, the, the deeper side of that is that it is um, very communal. And I think Wendy does something in her work that the archives I think can do is, um, you know, bring forth, you know, I think about the word disincarnate a lot, which is a good word to me because it, it's a way to note that someone can be present without um, you know, their meat suit being around anymore. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I hope that's what archives do. You know, there's that idea out there that I think is totally valid when people state it, that archives are where things go to die. Um, I think there's validity to that. I think there's ways to operate against it. So I kind of hold that thought as my, like, that's what I need to work against. Cause I think archives should be not that um, they should be where, where people can be present if they, if they are disincarnate. And I think Wendy's work echoes that so much, you know, too, by bringing, making sure these presences continually exist in the world, um, whether through photographs or, uh, you know, um, registrarial cards, uh, which have a magic to them that Wendy's really good at drawing out, um, you know, things that can seem like really, really dry objects. So I think delegation to me, yeah, it, it's like, it's a delegation of the disincarnate to me that, um, echoes the archives really well. What a nice phrase mm -hmm. I just thought of on this one. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's great. We'll, we'll mark it down as we take our notes tonight. Um, Josh and Wendy, could you tell us about the, um, the story of your uh, oral history that um, was done not only for the Smithsonian, but um, for Aperture. And I'm someone as an editor um, who loves the interview format. I love the artist's voice, and I think the, the primary text is so important uh, in many ways. And I was so excited to work with both of you on this interview um, that was originally 30,000 words, and you can read every one of them um, on the Smithsonian's website, but it's much um, condensed uh, for the Aperture book. But yes, so I think um, you flew to Portland, and then what happened, Josh? How does it work as a professional oral historian? <laughs> Uh, well, just shout out now to Ben Gillespie and Jennifer Snyder, who are the oral history, um, our, our oral historian and our oral history archivist at the archives, who are definitely, you know, central in this process. Um, so, yeah, we scheduled it. You know, these things take planning. Um, we scheduled it. I went out to Portland. Um, and then Wendy and I had adventures. I get one of the questions I've had for you, Wendy and Brendan, is uh, I mean, I was just so, I was so delighted to get the invitation. And I, you know, Wendy, we had just had that interaction of the 20 minute pandemic interview. And I did like 20 something of those. Um, you know, of course I remembered and it was memorable, but it was just a nice result from that. So I guess you had a good time, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I had a I had a great time, but I think you maybe don't remember that we actually I did like an hour long with you through the Joan Mitchell Foundation about papers, and so that really intrigued me because um, um, I had really no idea about artist papers um, and what that meant. So then I think when Brendan, because. Um, 
for, for me, I have a, an intimidation of the academic, um, especially coming from the reservation and going to grad school and learning grad school speak and the way that you talk about art. Um, and that was one of the things that I didn't want this monograph to, to, to do um, is um, feel super, super academic. And um, I wanted it to be per personal. Um, and so an interview I thought would be really wonderful. Um, and it just made sense. I think I thought I like Josh's personality. I've never met him in person. And I thought, well, why don't we ask Josh and see how that goes? And it, it went well enough for us to eat donuts and get tattoos together and go to waterfalls. So yeah. I, I think it was a success. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I love oral histories because they're so humanizing, you know, I'm like, I, I provoke people who teach a lot with like, I think you should just have a curriculum a whole semester where you only use oral histories and not academic textbooks because you get such a different human non-academic um, sense of the, the person and who they are. Um, yeah. And we got tattoos. And I'll <laughs> Probably the best part, one of the best parts of getting the tattoo that I don't think is in the book excerpt, but in the full transcript is um, Wendy, I see the question, what are the tattoos? We'll answer that. But Wendy, <laughs> you know, this was your first tattoo and I kind of gave you a heads up, like you're going to get this euphoric buzzy feeling a little bit after it's done. And um, so we got the tattoos and then we went back to recording and like 10, 20 minutes in, I think you started getting the buzzy, you know, euphoria feeling. And it's, but that's on the record now, which is just really, yes. there's, a, there's a lot of things on the record. And I think I even said, you know, when I'm older, like 60, um, we should probably do this again because I'll probably like, um, you know, have uh, other things to include to this yeah. oral history. Well, I love how the interview ends, which is, a, which is a kind of beautiful scene um, about naming. And when you're on Crow Agency and you asked, was it your father, um, if you could have an, take another name? Yes, yeah, I asked my dad. Um, yeah, there, Josh was able to get to some really great um, aspects and, and areas um, that we were able to include in the book. And one of them was my Upsalaga name. And I, I was given one when I was younger. Um, and um, just like a few years ago, I one of my um, grand uncles, I really like him and he's my dad's favorite uncle. Um, he was always doing creative things and the family really held him up as sort of this uh, cultural keeper. And I asked my dad what his name was and he said, oh, always creative or does, does things well. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, do you think I could have that name? And he said, I don't know, we should ask his uh, son, Clive Dust Jr. And um, yeah, it was very, um, how I would say, very crow. It, it, there was nothing flashy about it. We ended up um, finding him um, and uh, he said I could have the name, um, but I needed to give him four crow ceremonial things, which are blanket, tobacco, money, and um, um, fabric enough to make a shirt. And so we went and got those and we met him in a parking lot. And it just, I was like, can I have the name? And he's like, yeah. And I just handed it over and it was like, perfect. <laughs> um, but it's by 80 Chish is how you say it in Crow. Does things well, indeed. Jordan, um, turning to you, could you, uh, so first of all, for the readers uh, who have the book or who will hopefully, Jordan um, gives us a kind of masterclass in a very, very close reading of two pictures and was able to build out um, a beautiful argument um, about Wendy's work with portraiture and self-portraiture just by looking at two images. And I think um, we can learn a lot from that style and that mode of working. Um, what drew you, Jordan, to um, these two images, which I think hadn't actually been published or printed yet before, and how do you see portraiture and self-portraiture um, threading its way through Wendy's body of work? Sure. Well, I think um, when we were sort of figuring out what series or what works I would write on um, and sort of thinking about how we sort of could talk about portraiture through images. You know, I think the most 
increasingly iconic series of Wendy's of is the Four Seasons and the Absoluca feminist work. And those are works that are incredibly or increasingly more well known now. But when I saw these two photographs, Indian woman sitting and Indian woman standing, um, not only was I sort of delighted to see them because I had never seen them before, but they're very, very early in Wendy's practice, almost in the beginning of when she starts to pick up a camera and turn it towards herself. And I felt like they were so powerful and sort of for me form a kind of beginning of what is to come and how she will continue to expand this way of thinking about what it means to take a photograph of oneself and what it also means to embroider yourself in a history of, of a photographic history specifically um, of images that already exist that maybe have not been taken by people from that community and what the tensions and uh, sort of constellation of questions and ideas, you know, un, uh, are the, what the consequences of that are. And I felt like, you know, those two photographs were just so striking and that so much could be said and so much could be sort of understood later on by spending sensitive time with them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for me, I think some of the most arresting images that Wendy makes are images that include herself, namely because I think like her great, great grandmother, Julia, she is very comfortable in front of that camera. Um, <laughs> that camera enjoys her very much. And you also have a very, I would say serious, but also incredibly playful and uh, in, uh, uh, loose relationship, in my opinion, with photography and with the camera. Like you are there to sort of like do things to it as opposed to the, the camera doing things to you. There's such a like exciting imbalance of power that you come to your photographs and to the making of your photographs with. And I felt like in those two pictures that we, that we just saw, there was so much to be said about how you are interacting with your camera and what you want us to see. Um, and that there are jokes being made, but there are also like all great jokes, very serious things being said too. Um, and it was just a delight to spend time with them and to think through, you know, what the consequences of those two works are. Wendy and Jordan, could you talk a little bit about the significance of uh, Wendy, your collaboration with your daughter um, Beatrice and how that uh, becomes part of your body of work in, in, in this book as well. Yeah, um, so Beatrice, who is now 15, um, we had a collaborative practice when she was seven until about age 11 and sort of stumbled upon it um, when she produced like 20 drawings for an exhibition that I had at the Portland Art Museum and through that experience uh, I took her to the opening and she wanted to talk about her work um so I, I, I was like well I guess I'm gonna have to do that <laughs> um and so um she did and then that was when I realized that she is um not afraid um and a gifted public speaker and from there our collaborations were more based on um working with different museums and their collections and coming up with tours in which Beatrice would learn about the artworks and then lead tours specifically for children. Um, and she had a whole tour guide persona. Um, and um, we've also done artworks like um, Upsaliga Feminist and Upsaliga Roses. But I was really excited that she came out, she retired at age 11 which was fine. I was sort of sad about it, but uh, the dream. It like, yeah, it was like, it's a good model. We were like at a very high point. And it's like, that's a good, that's bold and a good model. Good for you. Um, but she came out of retirement um, at 14 to produce the Omnia, um, which is in the front and the back with uh, Julia's portrait as well. And so I made us, um, dresses that were as similar as I could to what Julia was wearing. And I even made um, the same jewelry 
and we wore our hair like Julia and B took my photo and I took B's photo. So I thought that was really beautiful. Um, and just had the conversation with her about knowing where this work will end up. It's going to be in, in a book and it will be on social media and the, your Portland high school art teacher might talk about it. Mm-hmm. Sorry, <laughs> but she was okay with that. <laughs> That's amazing. Jordan, do you know of other um, practices like that as an art historian where, where there's a mother and daughter um, collaboration or if, if you don't have one to call to mind, what, do you, what is your take on the kind of matrilineal feminist aspect of this type of way, this way of working? Sure. Well, um, on Saturday, when we were at Sergeant's Daughter seeing those works in person, someone described them like a ripple, um, uh, sort of coming towards you, the viewer, in space and time. And I think so much of what a photograph is, is a kind of distillation, a ripple, a a singular ripple in space and time, a kind of time capsule of something from the past that is continuing to be looked at today. And I think this sort of three part Julia, Wendy, Beatrice kind of matrilineal structure that that work sort of contains is this kind of reminder of these sort of uh, inheritances that I think Crow women especially walk in the world with, that you walk alongside and through and with your maternal ancestors who have taught you so much of your way of working and way of life whether that's through the beading that you're wearing on your clothing at Crow Fair, or whether that's the way you know how, you know, recipes in your head or the the way in which you make jokes or uh, uh, tell stories, all of that is sort of carried with you and and walks you through and forward in this life. Um, And so I think, at least for me, I mean, we could talk about many, many practices in the history of art that, that sort of acknowledge ancestral lineages and histories and ways of making and being. But I think, you know, Wendy's particular kind of um, way of capturing that to me is through this lineage of, of the photograph and how the photograph sort of tells a story and how she is sort of embroidering upon that story in her own, in her own way, through her own means um, and with her own sense of what these photographs and who these people are, because they are indeed her own ancestors. They are not, you know, images from an archive that are not, that are sort of distant, either historically, um, geographically, or culturally. They are, it's like looking through a a photo book. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Jordan, Jordan, yeah. can we we write that all down? We can. Can can we? We, We're transcribing this, girl. That was really good. That That was was really good. That was beautifully put. So um, I'm encouraging everyone in the audience to submit questions um, in the Q&A box. And in the meantime, a lightning round uh, for everyone quickly. Two questions that I'm hoping everyone will answer. Um, what do you, what are, what are your favorite design elements or moments in the book? Um, and what do you feel uh, is a signal contribution that Wendy is um, making to culture and to photography? And, Oh, I'll go first. I love the Maniacs inset, and I love learning about the Maniacs. And Wendy, I I forgot, I think we talked about it, but if there's recordings available, I want to hear those. Um, There there isn't. That's what's sad about it. Oh, maybe that's, yeah. So the Maniacs are, is Wendy's dad's band uh, that looks rad, and I want to hear those sounds. Um, And then I think, Wendy, I think your contribution is just like the power of fun you have fun and it's very clear in your work and fun's important and it's it can be scholarly and heavy and serious um and we shouldn't forget that and i think that's one of your great contributions i love that Emily? Oh, gosh, you did. Yeah. <laughs> josh, oh, Emily, so. yeah. no, josh you took mine i was gonna say the maniacs insert as well <laughs> i think it's just such a um and i have amazing... good taste right yeah <laughs> you do just with some amazing moment within the book um that just kind of is telling its own its own story but it's like woven woven with red thread directly into the into the pages and you know it's channeling some like neon hot pink um and dark red so it's just uh this amazing colorful moment um Wendy very generously let us put a pink wash over those 
images yes. and was not too precious yes. with the family archive. Yeah. For you, Jordan? I was about to say my homage to, to pink um, I yes. wear today. Um, I am actually, uh, I have this very like interesting thing, Wendy, with this book where I've just noticed how you're like, handwriting is so unbelievably specific and if you ever if you ever were accused of a crime I would be able to like find <laughs> find your your handwriting in no time um but I am completely obsessed with this photograph of Beatrice here who is like posing and all of the sort of like um personal photographs of Beatrice at Crow Fair with your family and members of your community and the way in which you're like holding her and looking at her with like such pride and such a sense of fun too. I just think what a special gift to, to everyone to sort of open those moments for all of us and to see that, you know, this is like work, you are a professional artist, but this is also like a life that you've shown and, 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 and given us and it's very special. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Wendy, do you have a favorite uh, moment in the book? Um, there, well, there's so many, but I definitely, I love all, well, I love all the, um, pairings. Um, Emily, it was like such a treat. It, it was like getting to see my work in new ways, um, new and unexpected ways. So I was always excited to see what you're going to do. Um, but I do, I really love this pairing. That's good. Yeah. And Julia writes so beautifully about the power of seeing your hands one day. So I think that's, I just want to mm -hmm. shout out to Julia there for that. Because for, the, for those on the call who may not know that as a member of the community, you can touch the objects in the collections without gloves. Is that At the National Museum correct? of the yeah. American Indian, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know what I'm going to say, which is this moment, and you can cue it up, Emily, which is Laylee Long Soldier's poems. Um, Wendy had a very generous vision to invite lots of different writers, including Tiffany Midge um, and uh, Lady Long Soldier, the poet, to contribute different um, different types of texts and have different moments in the book. And this one is just total um, genius to me. And I would just note that the red stitching, which was another element that Emily encouraged, these poems, there's two um, sort of groups of poems that Laylee Long Soldier um, contributed, and both of them were actually poems that she made in a social space, in an exhibition space in Canada, and a lot of them are dealing with the um, tragedy around the um, Indigenous uh, boarding schools in Canada, and she talks about the 500-year uh, failed experiment of colonialism and I think just to be so concise and generous and then Emily's amazing placement of this within this quilt so that as you read the poems you can see pictures of people and you may not know who they are but you can kind of imagine their lives I think it's um, a rare moment and honestly it's something that I think only Aperture could do because if we were doing a big exhibition catalog you know for you Wendy there might be certain academic pieces or whatever and you know this was a this moment of generosity and Laylee's voice is so is so powerful and I would just say one other thing which is that in terms of your contribution you know when we were launching Dina Lawson's book um almost four years ago now Dina very movingly said that she was hoping that um a young girl might go to the library and find her book one day and I that is my wish for you as well and the people that you've touched through this work and I, the other night Jordan said that you know this book speaks down through the generations and I totally agree with that and it will be wonderful to see how people find their way to this book in the future you know at the library or at your retrospective you know <laughs> at major museums and in different ways so um we will take a few questions and then move on to our summer um, reading recommendations. Um, this is a question for Wendy. Which archives are you currently researching um, or do you plan to research and how do you have a vision for how they might be incorporated into your practice? Yeah, I think right now I'm really interested in the Wanamaker expedition. Um, and the reason why I'm interested is because um, Rodman Wanamaker um, 
came in uh, to the Crow Reservation and there are a bunch of photos and a film that was made. And one of the films is like a, and it didn't just happen on my reservation, but um, several reservations ac across the country where it was like a, 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 a movie about citizenship and native people pledging their allegiance to um, the US and to citizenship. And it's, it's amazing footage. Um, but the thing that really struck me is that um, they would have these chiefs come up and they would um, dip their thumb in ink and then sign with their thumbprint. So you just saw this sort of white guy placing his hand on um, native hands. And so I'd love to find where that document is and where all those thumbprints are. Um, so that's sort of what I'm focused on now and, and who knows what will come of that. Amazing, we look forward to seeing that. Um, and then one other quick question for Wendy, which is, is there any significance to um, the rose as a part of um, Crow culture or visual culture? Yeah, um, well, I am doing a, a solo exhibition at the Denver Art Museum in 2023, and their crow collection um, has so many florals, um, floral beadwork. And um, every time I see that collection, I think it reminds me of my grandmother. And I think that was probably her influence for her beadwork. So, um, yeah, it's just a certain style. There's geometric and then there's these floral designs. And so that was just ingrained in the style of uh, crow imagery. Mm -hmm. This is a question for um, Emily, although Wendy may want to jump in as well. Um, a lot of your work, um, Wendy, is sculptural and lives as a physical object, or it might be a site-specific installation. Um, and there's lots of different textures and objects that had to be photographed, et cetera. So how, um, what were the challenges of making a book like this, where it's not actually a traditional photo book with like, you know, 70 plates. It's like dealing with a lot of different materials. And I should just say that Emily was incredible at figuring out how to organize a lot of this information and she really played a role as a kind of second um, editor but was that a challenge for you Emily or did you enjoy figuring out how to kind of make this translation? Um, no I think using the word translation is very accurate and and and, and spot on and I think that's where um, you know from the very beginning um, this wasn't uh, ever intended to be this kind of uh, traditional or more traditional catalog so there was so much more room to interpret and explore and I think actually in the brief it was like it should explode out of the book um, I think that was a line from the brief so I think those kind of those those uh, that thinking was really an invitation to pull out some like different kind of moments so I think this was a an incredible like body of work that you know a gatefold for example helped mm -hmm. to again help to place a viewer like in this in this environment in this long um multi-decade timeline um within her work so i think um i would say challenge uh, not so much a challenge it was just a, an invitation to think a little differently mm -hmm. about how we could translate it amazing I love that moment with the, the gatefold. I, I hope that people who have the book will look at it closely. And I agree with Jordan, the handwriting is very, very specific and <laughs> I love it. Um, last question for Wendy, what surprised you most about making your first um, monograph? Oh, um, everything. I just realized like how, how, how much goes into a book. I've never uh, like looked or thought about paper so much. <laughs> and it makes such a huge difference, the different textures. Um, it truly is a collaborative practice. I couldn't have done it without everybody here on the panel and uh, um, Tiffany Image and Laylee Long Soldier um, and Julia Brian Wilson. So yeah, and from my studio assistant and my gallerist all helping to find all of these images from various hard drives <laughs> and encouraging me to like um, find the titles. Um, so yeah, it was just really wonderful to have an opportunity to view my work in this context. 
Mm -hmm. And for the historical record, because now it's there, as Emily said at the beginning, it's, it's, a, it's a record of a moment in time. So um, I just in conclusion today, um, the Aperture Photo Book Club is going on summer hiatus. So um, Sarah Meister kindly encouraged us to give everyone some summer reading recommendations. And they're not just photo books. Um, and we'll follow this up um, with an email to members of the photo book club as well. So you have your reading um, ideas over the next weeks and months. Uh, so Josh, do you want to start us off with your uh, summer reading? Sure. Um, my summer reading rec is Brown Neon, a collection of essays by Raquel Gutierrez. Uh, we just did an interview about it that's out in Gulf Coast Journal online. And after this, I'm going to go down to Leslie Lohman where there's a launch party happening to celebrate Raquel. Brown Neon, great book. Fantastic. Emily? Um, I recently got my hands on the um, Enzo, very thick Enzo Mari um, curated by Hans Aldrich Olbrist book from Italy. So I'm going to try to dig into a, a really big monograph. Great. Uh, Jordan? So I have two. Great. Um, I just finished Margot Jefferson's Constituting a Nervous System or Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir, um, which I think she is one of the greatest American critics of our time and an incredible writer and, you know, has lived and seen everything um, and continues to. So uh, I just finished that, but um, I just started uh, Edith Wharton's Old New York because I'm spending more time in New York and mm. it's a very campy, but very wonderful romp through the horrific and fabulous Gilded Age. I, I totally co-sign the Margot Jefferson recommendation. And for anyone who's interested in book design, Margot Jefferson's first, well, not first book, but last major book called Negro Land was designed by um, Oliver Monday and, and draws upon the Johnson Magazine archive. And it is a brilliant um, Agreed. book design. So check it out. And Wendy? OK. <laughs> um, so my pick is called Black Dolls from the collection of Deborah Neef. It's a, it's a book of 100 unique handmade African dolls made between 1850 and 1930. Um, it's, it's incredible, um, which I don't know if you can even see that. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. And so basically, it's just this book, these photos of all these Black dolls that were made by enslaved people for white children. And um, you can see um, also pictures of portraits of white children with their um, black dolls. Um, so it's just a collection of all those dolls and it's an incredible book. Wow, fascinating. I think there might even be yeah. a show right now that is happening about black dolls. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you for that. And I also have two, one is um, a monograph by Dave Heath, uh, American photographer who made photographs in um, New York uh, in the 50s. They're very emotional. He pushes the, this is published by Stanley Barker. It's called Washington Square. And it opens up with a long excerpt from Howell by Allen Ginsberg. But um, Dave Heath um, pushes the blacks very, very hard. And the prints that he made, which were on view in Paris a few years ago, are exquisite. And this book is like a great summer um yeah emotional photo book i guess with a beautiful cover i don't know what you would call this cover style um when uh, emily but um i'm into it um and then a novel which i'm always vlogging on everyone it's one of my favorites it's called heaven and earth which is by paulo giordano and it's such a good summer read um it was a read from the, uh, that I found in 2020. And it's about um, a young girl from Turin who goes to Puglia in Italy and ends up living on this farm and devoting her whole life to farm work, even though she was um, from a middle-class family and her parents expected her to go to university and her parents never understood her um, swerve in life choices to live on this farm and, and go back to the land. And um, it's an incredibly beautiful book. And that will, is my recommendation. 
So um, that brings us to the end of the Aperture Photo Book Club of celebrating Wendy Red Star. It's been such a pleasure. And I will just say it was just such a treat and an honor to work with all of you. I loved working on this book. I love Wendy's work. And I'm really happy that the relationship that began years ago with a piece for the website, actually, for Aperture's website, and then by Will Matsuda, and then grew into an engagement with the magazine and then this book and i hope um, we'll collaborate again and i thank you all for your you. really meaningful contributions and um it's been a pleasure to see you tonight thank you everyone thanks bye thanks y'all thank you all